Good evening, everyone. My name is Ken Howard, and as director of the North Carolina Museum of History, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, Building the White House, Irish and Scottish Connections. The White House is one of the most recognizable landmarks in the world, yet few know the names or stories of those responsible for its design and construction. If you look beneath the paint that gives the walls of the White House its name and focus your attention on their placement, marks, scars, carvings, and shapes, you might think about the hundreds of individuals who transformed raw outcroppings of Virginia stone into building blocks that resulted in a monumental home for America's presidents. Tonight, we'll learn about some of the stories behind the construction of the White House, including the contributions of immigrants and enslaved workers. This will be detailed in two books, James Hoban, Designer and Builder of the White House, and A White House of Stone, Building America's First Ideal in Architecture. Both of these books are available in our museum shop, and I would encourage you to check them out. Our speaker, Stuart McGarren, is president of the White House Historical Association, is uniquely qualified to talk about the history of the People's House. Mr. McLaurin as president of the White House Historical Association since 2014, leads the association's nonprofit and nonpartisan mission to support conservation and preservation at the White House with non-government funding. Under his leadership, the association has greatly expanded its mission, reach, and impact, including fundraising, educational public programming, and award-winning publications that tell, tell the story of the White House history. They are even developing retail offerings inspired by history. 2021 proved to be the most successful year in the association's 60-year history. Mr. McLaurin also has a North Carolina connection as he was Elizabeth Dole's chief of staff at the American Red Cross. And he has held leadership roles with national nonprofit and educational organizations that include George Washington University, excuse me, Georgetown University, and the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. After his presentation, Mr. McLaurin will have time to answer some questions about the White House and the people involved in its construction. Use the chat feature on your screen to send us your questions. Our program coordinator, Michelle Carr, will moderate your questions for Mr. McLaurin after his talk. And now, please join me in welcoming Stuart McLaurin. Stuart? Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you, Ken, for that uh, very kind introduction. It's really an honor for me to be with you tonight, even though it has to be virtually. I'm very proud to say that I am a native North Carolinian. I was actually born at the old Rex Hospital there in Raleigh. Still have many North Carolinian relatives scattered from the triad to the coast. And I always look forward to my return visits a couple of times every year. As a boy, I would spend each summer with my grandparents in Raleigh and Durham. And my grandmother and I would spend many Saturdays at the Archives and History Museum. And also, uh, I love the memories of buying peanuts from the pigeon man and feeding the pigeons on the Capitol grounds. And those are really wonderful memories for me. One of my specific vivid memories is of the replica of Canova's George Washington in the lobby of the old Archives and History Building. Seeing that as a boy, I never dreamed that one day I would actually work at George Washington's home, Mount Vernon, or serve as president of this organization, the White House Historical Association, the actual building that George Washington envisioned to be the home of the president here in the federal city. A few months ago in February, I visited your museum and saw many young children with their parents and grandparents learning about the history of the great state of North Carolina, just as I had done as a young boy. Well, it's an honor to return again, at least virtually with you tonight, and to share the history of the People's House, the White House, and how it was built by a diverse group of enslaved and free laborers, European artisans and others who were convened in and around what we now know as Lafayette Park, which is actually right outside my window this evening. Telling the rich stories of White House history has been the mission of the White House Historical Association since we were founded 60 years ago by First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. It was her vision in 1961 to create an organization to provide non-taxpayer funding to maintain the museum standard of the house 
which she found lacking when she and President Kennedy entered the White House in January of 1961. In fact, to this day, we are still totally privately funded. Of course, the federal government has always cared for the infrastructure of the House, but congressional public funding has traditionally been lacking for design and decoration of the White House, and also acquiring art and furnishings for a permanent White House collection. In fact, first families who wanted new furniture over the years often had to sell the old things with little regard or appreciation for the historic significance of what was being discarded. Really, really tragic story in White House history. An example of this is when Chester Arthur auctioned off 24 wagon loads, if you can believe it, of furniture in 1882. Another example is in the 1850s when President Buchanan disposed of 52 pieces of French Belanger furniture brought to the White House by President James Monroe in 1817, leaving just one piece behind in the White House collection. So you can see by the time of the Kennedys, the house was a collection of things ranging from literally department store furnishings to assorted remnants from other presidencies. So to address this vision that she had, Mrs. Kennedy set about to create a private partner for the White House, the White House Historical Association. And she approached the types of individuals, people who provide resources to the great American museums around the country, like would be provided uh, by your supporters to the museum uh, there in Raleigh. Today, thanks to Mrs. Kennedy and also follow-up leadership by First Lady, Lady Bird Johnson, the White House now has its own curator and curatorial staff. Prior to that, there was nobody to actually take care of the art and objects and furniture and furnishings. Now these furnishings and appointments are exactly to the standard that Mrs. Kennedy envisioned, the very best of America, and they're cared for as they should be. Also, uh, thanks in no small part to contributions and support from the White House Historical Association, it was in 1988 that the American Association of Museums actually accredited the White House as a museum. So the White House that you enjoy and see today operates with a formal official collection like the great American museums do, just like yours. Well, Mrs. Kennedy also had a real heart and passion for education. She first visited the White House as a young teenager with her mother, and she was really disappointed that there was no guidebook like she was accustomed to get when she would visit uh, other museums in New York or uh, wherever that she may visit. So the very first order of business for our organization, for the association after our founding, was to publish the first White House guidebook. We are now in the 24th edition of that book and we'll publish the 25th on our anniversary in uh, November. Our publications have led to a rich history of educational programs online and in person, as well as the publication of many books over the years. We've actually published 40 since uh, I became president in 2014. And our quarterly magazine, which is perhaps my favorite a publication. Actually, there's a great story I wanna uh, tell you about in this particular issue. Each issue, we feature a different presidential site from around the country. And this is issue 61, which is just out this week. And in it, we feature Tryon Palace in New Bern and the story of George Washington's visit there in the spring of 1791. I'll tell you more about that visit in a few minutes. But our most recent uh, publication, as Ken mentioned, was James Hoban, a uh, designer and builder of the White House. And that's really the story that will be the focus of my remarks to you today. So let's step back to 1790. A Congress is meeting in Philadelphia and they passed the Residence Act with the strong backing of President George Washington. The location of the national capital had been a contentious issue between the Northern and Southern states, first being located in New York City and then in Philadelphia. President Washington sought a capital on the Potomac and to financially centralize state debts within the federal government. Both of these things were achieved through the Residence Act. This act gave the president 10 years, starting in 1790, 
to develop a new national capital from 10 square miles of land procured from the states of Virginia and Maryland here along the Potomac River. Now we know this legacy today to be called uh, Washington DC, but it was initially referred to as the federal city. So to begin this work, a group of commissioners was created to oversee the project. You've of course heard the uh, story of Pierre L'Enfant, the French architect who laid out the general grid and plans for the federal city, but you may not have heard of our hero today, James Hoban, who was a young Irish carpenter and wheelwright, and he evolved his skills here in the America, in Charleston, South Carolina, to become today what we would call an architect. He would not have had that title at the time, but it's what we would refer to him today. Hoban left Ireland and came to the United States in the 1780s. He was in his late 30s. He had been trained under the supervision of the renowned Thomas Ivory in Dublin and at the Dublin Society's School of Architectural Drawing. So he had a really good base of education in Ireland. He then found himself in a southern city of charm and growth, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, which you all know well. And it was there that he connected with Pierce Purcell. Now Purcell was an established local carpenter and it's actually believed that he have, may have been a cousin of Hoban's from Ireland, someone that he knew before going there. So Hoban lived in Charleston with the Purcells at 43 Trot Street. And for those of you who know Charleston later that became Wentworth Street. Uh, Hoban built a house next door that he later sold in 1798 when he decided to stay here in the federal city and not return to Charleston. But it was there that Purcell and Hoban, actually they were both uh, Roman Catholics. Uh, they founded a St. Mary's Catholic Church in Charleston and they were also the founding members of the Masonic Lodge there in Charleston. It's believed that they worked together on many buildings there, perhaps even the rebuilding of the uh, colonial era state house that had been burned. Uh, there was a rush to rebuild that Capitol building with the hopes of actually keeping the state Capitol in Charleston. Of course, that did not uh, prevail. Well, George Washington met Hoban in Charleston after he ventured south from Newburn in 1791, continuing that story uh, from earlier during his Southern tour. And a year later, back in Philadelphia in 1792, he was beginning to focus on who would actually build the presidential house. And his mind recalled seeing the buildings in Charleston that Hoban had been responsible for, buildings inspired by those great Irish country houses in his home county of uh, uh, Kilkenny and, and uh, Leinster House in Dublin, which is the home now to the Irish uh, parliament. When I visited Ireland, I, I remember walking up on that facade of, of Leinster House, this great building. And it was clear and obvious to me then that it had to be the inspiration uh, for the White House. Uh, like Leinster House, Hoban designed the president's house to appear to be on three levels, but Hoban later removed one of them. So as you look at our White House today, it appears to be just two main levels on the interior that would be the state floor and the residence floor, uh, but believe it or not, that's a bit deceiving. There are actually six different levels, full levels or partial levels in the main residence of the White House today. There were other places in Dublin, which I've had the privilege to visit, such as the old Newcomen Bank, which is now an office building. And I have vivid memories of walking into this beautiful building and the oval rooms that were to me hauntingly reminiscent of our, um, our oval rooms that are in the main residence of the White House today. You know, there's the diplomatic reception room on the ground floor, that's the president, that's the room where you see the president walk through to go out to the helicopter, the blue room on the state floor, and the yellow oval room up on the residence level. Now, of course, there's the oval office, but that did not appear until later in the uh, 20th century. So there were these beautiful oval rooms that I saw there in Dublin, and then saw again, in, uh, we see every day in the White House, and there was a real synergy to them, uh, to me. Well, I really have to believe that George Washington thumb, uh, his thumb was on the scale of selecting Hoban as the architect. There were really many contenders, many people competed uh, to have that role, including uh, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson really wanted that role, but it was Hoban who was selected and he immediately set about to assemble 
the team of craftsmen, artisans, laborers who would work together to build the president's house. Washington himself selected the exact siting, which is right across the, the park where I'm sitting now. I can see the north face of the, cat, the, uh, the White House there this evening. And the orientation and, uh, of the plot of the land and the, 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 where the door, the north door, as we would call it today, the front door of the White House would be located. So the cornerstone was then placed on October 13, 1792, and Washington himself actually was not present. He was present for the Capitol cornerstone laying, but not the uh, White House. A carpenter shed, and this is a really central to our story, a carpenter shed was the center of the building activity that we know today as uh, taking place in Lafayette Park. This was the hub of all the workers who worked and lived around the park area. There were enslaved workers that we know who were rented out by their owners uh, to be a part of this project. And uh, actually very important to our work is the past five years we've spent doing research on the role of those enslaved persons, not only in building the White House, but those enslaved to or rented to believe it or not, nine of the first 12 American presidents. Now we think of our early presidents having slaves at Mount Vernon, Monticello, Montpelier, and other houses and plantations away from Washington. But these nine actually had enslaved persons working with and for them in the White House during their presidencies. And our research tells that story. You can explore that more on our website, whitehousehistory.org. Well, the focus of us doing this work came about in the summer of 2016, when then First Lady Michelle Obama gave a commencement address at the City College of New York in a speech later that summer at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. And I could still hear the words in, uh, in my ears, ringing in my ears this evening, which she said, I wake up every day in a house built by slaves. And you can imagine our website after that was inundated with requests for more information and to know the story behind that story. So that began our Slavery in the President's Neighborhood initiative. Today, we have identified over 300 individuals by name or partial name who were part of building the historic People's House and who worked in the White House for our early presidents. And I really do encourage you to explore that information on our website. Well, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about the actual stone uh, from which the White House was built. Most, most of the stone for the White House was acquired from the Aquia Quarry, which is located about 30 miles down the Potomac River from what is now Washington, D.C. The enslaved and free workers who carved that stone from the ground, you can actually still go there today, it's a county park in Stafford County, Virginia, and many of you may have driven up and down I-95 and you can actually see an exit for Aquia. It's really a beautiful stroll there, uh, stepping back in time. You can see the markings that remain on the stone outcroppings, and it really takes your mind's eye back to a time when the workers labor there to remove that stone. Now, they took it upstream where other laborers would move it uh, from the river to the workyard right here by the White House. There were seven Scottish stonemasons who came over from Scotland they were actually forbidden by British law to leave the country due to the war between Britain and France at that time. Their labor and work on homes in the Newtown area of Edinburgh had come to a halt because of the war. So they really needed work and they risked coming to this country illegally. They signed out from their Masonic Lodge in Edinburgh with a very poignant note, which you can still go and read today. And I've actually done it and it's really fascinating. And they said, essentially, I've gone to America. Well, they came to this federal city and they quickly set about to work with James Hoban to carve out the incredible intricacies that still adorn the White House today. Now, an interesting discovery was made just a few years ago by our senior historian at the time, the late Dr. William Seal, wonderful man. He actually did a terrific book, um, did a lot of research uh, on, on resources in North Carolina as well. And Dr. Seal um, regarded um, focused on the rose carvings that were above the pilasters all around the White House. And in his research, he discovered that these rose carvings were called double Scottish roses. 
Now, this was a rose that we found out was very popular in Scotland in the late 1700s. It was actually a symbol of Scottish immigration to the New World. Now, this flower later became popular throughout Britain in the Victorian area, but it had a very specific meaning to the Scots. It was a mark of uh, Scottish uh, pride, and we therefore believe that the Scots put it around the house and what I like to think was a, a I call it a Scottish wink uh, to history. Uh, the now, every time I look at the White House, I can't unsee those roses that are on the pilasters around the White House. Well, these stonemasons were very gifted in their craft. The soft sandstone from Aquia was very similar to the stone that they would have used in Scotland. And perhaps it had been determined that the White House would be built from marble or a harder stone. Maybe there would have been artisans from Italy who were more familiar with the hard stone and maybe they would have been called upon. But it was the Scottish stonemasons who were brought over and their mark remains on the White House today in a very significant and important way. Just a few years ago, we had the opportunity to work with an organization called Historic Environment Scotland to bring over one of their current stonemasons. And he carved a double Scottish rose from the same size stone, <coughs> excuse me, from the same size stone from Aquia as would have been used in the 1790s as a demonstration for our supporters who were gathered here in Washington. It was really quite incredible to watch because he was working with modern tools that they use today. They would have been much, much more difficult with the primitive tools that they would have used in the 1790s. Well, interestingly enough, as the house was being built, life around the park, the area that of the, the carpenter shed and the area that was being used had the dimensions of everyday life as it would have today. There were places for them to live. There were places and ways for them to eat and drink. And actually worship was an important dynamic. We do know that the workers of the Catholic faith worshiped in that carpenter shed, as did Presbyterians. In fact, uh, James Hoban was Roman Catholic and, and was the builder of the first church of any denomination in Washington outside of Georgetown. Now there was Holy Trinity, the Jesuit church in Georgetown connected with the university, but that was too far away for the workers to venture on Sunday from right here at the park. So the church that Tobin created was St. Patrick's Catholic Church, and the successor to that initial building remains today just a few blocks from the White House and where I sit this evening. There's actually a wonderful plaque on the front of St. Patrick's today that commemorates Hoban not only as the builder of the White House, but also that first St. Patrick's Church in Washington. And of course, I can't leave out the uh, Presbyterians, the National Presbyterian Church, up Massachusetts Avenue in Northwest Washington traces its roots back to those who worshiped in the carpenter shed as well, including our Scottish stonemason friends. Did we go off? No, we're still on. I'm Our sorry. Battery died. I see. Well, James, Hay James Hoban was a Freemason as was George Washington. And we think perhaps their connectivity in Masons, as Masons was important to their relationship and communication as to how to design uh, and uh, build the White House. Uh, we actually did a podcast recently with some Masons here in uh, um, uh, Washington, D.C., who talked about how they uh, would have had a, a language that they spoke almost unto themselves and built the White House uh, with that, uh, common, uh, that in common. Well, um, the White House uh, uh, was then built, and um, uh, George Washington, we don't, we don't have any report of George Washington actually going into the White House once it was built, but when he was traveling back to Mount Vernon from Philadelphia, he stopped uh, and Hoban uh, paraded the workers in front of him, uh, and he continued on to Mount Vernon, and it was uh, John and Abigail Adams that were the first to move uh, into the White House. Well, now we know that this, um, this house was, um, was built of stone. And of course the Aquia uh, stonemasons uh, with the stone that came from Aquia was very popular in Europe, but it was not so common in America. George Washington wanted a stone house because he knew it would be respected 
uh, by the leaders uh, of Europe. Uh, Washington knew Hoban's had been trained uh, by this in Ireland, and uh, he had seen that in Hoban's work there, and he was familiar with uh, Hoban's work in, 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 uh, in Ireland uh, as well, and that that would equip him uh, for this work in Charleston. Well, so George Washington wanted to have a great stone house, but there was caution being expressed by many of the founding fathers, particularly Thomas Jefferson, because remember Thomas Jefferson had submitted a design for the White House. Jefferson cautioned that the White House should not be a palace that would be common for monarchs in European capitals, uh, because the president after all is not a monarch, but a citizen entrusted with uh, temporary executive authority equally balanced between the judiciary and the legislative branches. So while Jefferson sought a much more modest house given his anti-federalist positions, Washington wanted something more prominent to demand the respect uh, for both the office of the president uh, uh, and, and our country, our young country from Europeans and Americans. So the end result was Hoban's design which struck the right balance between uh, both visions. Hoban's design, uh, though large by the standards of the time for American homes, is considered small today when contrasted to, say, uh, Buckingham Palace. But it's this building that has stood the test of time for 229 years since the cornerstone was laid in 1792 as a symbol of American freedom and democracy to the world, which I, I believe that it remains today. Uh, actually, there are billions of people around the world who recognize that symbol of American freedom and democracy. They will never visit the United States. They will certainly never visit the White House, and the vast majority of them will never even meet an American in their lifetime, but they understand the symbol of that house. So although George Washington selected the site of the land, he didn't live in the White House. It was John and Abigail Adams that were the first occupants when they moved in in November of 1800. Then, as you all know, in August 1814, the British advanced on the city of Washington, ironically led uh, by an Irishman in the British Army. So you had an Irish builder and then an Irishman who burned it down, and they set fire to the Capitol and the White House. And the, the White House was so charred uh, that um, it, to its core, really, leaving much of the walled structure in ruins. In fact, a part of the White House stone is left unpainted so the scorch marks can be seen as a reminder of that occasion in our history. And as seen here, uh, larger scorch marks can be seen from time to time as the White House is stripped uh, for repainting. Well, after the White House was rebuilt, Hoban actually rejoined the cause during the presidencies of uh, James Monroe and Andrew Jackson to build uh, the North and South porticos. They were contemplated in the original design, but those were not completed until much later, and it was late into the uh, 1820s with the Jackson administration when the uh, second portico was completed. Well, the White House really revolved uh, without much change up until the turn of the 20th century when President Teddy Roosevelt undertook a significant renovation of the White House. It was actually under Roosevelt that the executive mansion became officially known as the White House. Uh, that first appeared under Roosevelt on the executive stationery. Up until that time, the main building of the White House uh, served as the home to the president and his family, the office for the president and his staff, and also they received thousands of visitors from the public uh, each year. Uh, it's actually interesting, Roosevelt had such a large personal family that he chose to build I think Mrs. Roosevelt had a word in this as well, chose to build another building just to the west of the main building. Of course, we now know that to be the West Wing today where the offices of the president and his staff are held. Well, all went well with just uh, minor modifications and patching until the presidency of uh, Harry Truman. And of course, uh, Truman became president toward the end of World War II and the end of the Great Depression and it, probably wouldn't have been proper for a large amount of attention and financial resources to have been placed into the restoration of the White House with those two uh, great um, uh, concerns uh, facing him as president. But the compelling cause of the need to have some work done on the White House uh, came home to Truman when he 
when anyone would walk on the residence floor, the great bohemian chandeliers, there are three of them in the East Room that were installed under the Roosevelt uh, era renovation, they would sway, they would actually sway. And then one evening, um, his daughter, Margaret Truman was playing the piano up in the residence level and the leg of that piano went through the floor and into the ceiling below. And Truman uh, realized that uh, something had to be done in order to save the White House, not only for them, but for future presidents. So in 1948, President Truman, Bess and Margaret moved across the street for three and a half years to the Blair House, which as you know, is the president's guest house and major restoration and renovation work was done to the White House at that time. The entire interior was gutted. Uh, steel infrastructure was put in place. It, it still had the wooden beams from the 1814 to 1817 construction, then it was built out. It was so important to Truman that the White House exterior be maintained to give the appearance of American strength and stability, and that that would still be seen uh, to the world. So the essential work of that Truman restoration remains the foundation of the White House to this day. 45 presidents after John Adams moved in, the work of James Hoban is known to the world. And this is really remarkable to me. Here's this man that's a little known. No, many people know the name James Hoban, but what's remarkable is that his life's work and legacy is known by three words, the White House in that 229 year span of history of that house. Now that's a very short period of time by world history standards, but it's a long time in the measure of American history. The People's House, which has been the home to American presidents and first families. Well, the, through the work of the White House Historical Association and the publishing of our new book on James Hoban, designer and builder of the White House and our book on uh, the other book that Ken mentioned, uh, the book on the stonemasons. And again, both of these are available in your museum bookshop. We at the association continue to tell these important stories and preserve their important legacy in our nation's history for future generations. I know you'll enjoy both of these books if you have the opportunity to read them. And if I could put in a little plug, they think, I think they both make a great uh, graduation gift or a Father's Day gift. In closing, I'd like to share that 2021 is the 60th anniversary of the White House Historical Association. And over these 60 years, we've had the privilege to work with 12 presidents and first ladies. Our role is exactly the same, regardless of who may be in the White House. We're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and we have that private partnership with the White House that Mrs. Kennedy created on behalf of the American people. It's been really a privilege over these 60 years to invest over $110 million to maintain that new museum standard and to acquire art and furnishings for the permanent White House collection. And we're really humbled and honored to be Mrs. Kennedy's a living legacy in that work. So I hope you'll follow us on our social media channels. You'll explore our website and digital offerings. And I'd love for you to download my monthly podcast, which I really enjoy doing which unpacks the stories of White House history. And you can find that as well as White House history at uh, whitehousehistory.org or wherever you get your uh, podcast. This is uh, one audience that I know has a heart for history and uh, your museum, the North Carolina Museum of History is really a fantastic resource uh, for the state of North Carolina. And I know that uh, Ken and his team really do a terrific job and it's been an honor to join you tonight. So with that, a bit of uh, history and reflection, I'd be happy to uh, take your questions. All right, uh, Stuart, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Uh, my name is Michelle Carr, and I am curator of special projects and programs actually here at the North Carolina Museum of History. We're so glad you could join us tonight. And please send us your questions. I know you have plenty. They're starting to pour in. Uh, we're going to share your questions with Stuart, take advantage of his knowledge and expertise, and learn more about the fascinating story behind the White House. But before we talk about the books and the White House, I do want to give a nod out. Stuart, as you said, this is the 60th anniversary of the White House Historical Association. It's a wonderful organization that owes its roots to Mrs. Kennedy, who considered the White House a living museum. Um, she talked about that often, that it was the people's house, but it was also a living museum. 
You all have a wonderful representation of educational programs. You do teacher institutes. Uh, you have online resources for students and adults. You do symposiums. Uh, you do your wonderful podcast. I've enjoyed the 1600 sessions myself. Um, and someone wanted to know if we wanted to find out more about your podcast, could you just tell us that name very quickly? I think you've got some new audience members lining up. Sure. Well, first of all, I, I want to apologize. I didn't realize I just found out uh, that during my talk, our camera died. So you may have been able to hear me, but not see me. So we've kind of made an on the fly adjustment here. So I apologize uh, for that. Um, but I'm, but um, I would love for, um, uh, I'm sorry, I, with that, I was too worried about apologizing. What was it? <laughs> remind me what your question was. Uh, uh, sorry, I was asking you about your podcast. We had some people yeah. who want to start listening and sure. you tell it's us the called, name. They, they're excited and they want to start thank listening you. right now. It's called the 1600 <laughs> Sessions. And That's each it. month yep. we take on a different topic of White House history. Uh, it's, it's in its, I think we have 58 episodes now. Uh, they are available on our website, uh, all of them. And uh, I actually had somebody email me this week and told me that they had uh, done, uh, what do you call it, binge watching. They had watched all 58 episodes in, in, uh, at one, I guess, not at one time, but uh, in, in short order of time. And I love that. You know, one thing I love about my job is we're an education organization and we teach and tell these stories of White House history. But I also get to learn something every day. And that's what makes the job uh, enjoyable to me. We know the White House Historical Association is responsible for the building. We know that is it your primary concern. We think about that as your, your main um, artifact is the actual structure, but you're also responsible for preserving the interiors with the items there that are associated with the presidency. Mrs. Um, Kennedy, and justly so, gets, gets the credit for helping found the organization, also express her interest in and preservation throughout DC, particularly in Lafayette Square, where you are right now. But she is not the only First Lady who's been interested in preservation. Are there some other projects you'd like to uh, mention and while we're talking? Sure. Well, we do tend to talk about Mrs. Kennedy a fair amount mm -hmm. since she founded our organization. But not only the, the, the 12 that we've had the privilege of working with, but going back before that, I don't want it to sound like that nobody cared about the White House before Mrs. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. They did. They just didn't have the innovative and creative way to come up with the resources like Mrs. Kennedy did. Others since her time, uh, Mrs. Nixon, I think is unheralded or underheralded for all that she did. She brought in a tremendous amount of Americana, far more than Mrs. Kennedy did. In fact, uh, we recently, we have a wonderful book coming out in July called uh, Designing Camelot. It's the story of Mrs. Kennedy's renovation. Uh, Jim Abbott. And, and, and in it, we, we list, in this new edition, we list all of the projects that we funded since, in every administration since the Kennedys. And it was in the Nixon administration that we funded the most, actual acquisitions. And most of that was Americana. A couple of other projects that have been undertaken, Laura Bush uh, wanted to take the Lincoln bedroom back to what it looked like most, most closely to what it looked like when it became a bedroom. As you know, it was a office in a cabinet room during Lincoln's presidency. So we did the research on that and, and took that back to a time uh, that, would, that she wanted in, in that particular uh, period setting. She was also a librarian and so wanted to redo the library and we did some work with her on that. Very interestingly, Michelle Obama uh, did something that was innovative and a little bit controversial. To have an item in the White House collection as an artist, the artist should be deceased according to the collection standards and policies of the White House. The artist should be deceased and the work of art should be at least 25 years old or older. The idea is so that current artists start beating their chests that my work is in the White House. But as we get more into the 21st century, the great American artists of the late 20th century are becoming eligible. So Mrs. Obama wanted to create a gallery, if you will. And so Rauschenberg, Albers, Alma Thomas, the first African-American female artist, from the 1960s Washington Color School. These works were acquired and put into the White House uh, in a very special room, almost like a gallery unto itself. And uh, that represented in her way, in her mind's eye, the very best of America. So I could name projects like that for each of the first ladies that we've worked with. And they, they really do take it seriously as uh, something that they're giving and leaving for the country, knowing that they just live there temporarily. 
Well, you mentioned that prior to having really the purchasing power to maintain the association, the presidents and their families often had to sell off parts of what we think of as the national wow. collection to support their lifestyle. And I imagine part of your work is trying to track down some of these pieces and return them to the White House. That's right. Uh, there was that Belanger suite of furniture that I mentioned that uh, uh, James Monroe bought. There were 53 pieces. Buchanan got rid of 52 of them, left one piece in the White House. Mrs. Kennedy said, well, let's try to retrieve as many pieces as we can. Originally 53, working with Mrs. Kennedy and since, we have retrieved 10 of the 53. We know where four other pieces are, but we can't just go in and grab them because they were distributed legally, but the rest are lost to history. Now, maybe in some great grandmother's attic, uh, there will be an appearance of one at some point, uh, but it's really, really a tragic story of history that earlier presidents didn't appreciate the value of the history and the, that that furniture would carry with it through the generations, and so off it went. Fortunately, we have organizations like the White House Historical Association so that that's not the case now. Uh, and thank goodness, thank you for all the work you and your staff do in preserving what is the People's House, a that's living right. museum, as we've said. Let's talk a little bit about the books and James Hoban. That's why we're here tonight. Sure, sure. I think of when I go to the White House, uh, and I've never actually been on a tour, and I'm embarrassed. I even We'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to fix that. So, uh, But the I love reopen. visiting. I love visiting the Historical Association. You all have wonderful items there. And among my favorites are your books. And of course, Thanks. the book that you have that you've recently published that was just came out on St. Patrick's Day, appropriately enough, That's right. is the, the new book about James Hoban, the designer and builder of the White House. And you also reference um, the earlier work that, that William Seal helped put together, looking at the Scottish stonemasons. Um, there's also going to be a third book in the series. And that's going to tell us a little right. about this coming up. That, that's right. The Hoban book and the Stone book that I held up are the first two in the series. The third will be a book on the enslaved people and the research that we've done and the significant role uh, that they have and that they've had in American history. I also will share, uh, I'll give a little sneak preview. Nobody outside our staff knows this right now, but uh, we've been working with the National Park Service to create a marker that will go in Lafayette Park that will tell the story of those enslaved people who helped build the house, but also the history of, of protests in the park that date back the really the first official protests were the suffragettes a century ago in Lafayette Park. And then the work that Mrs. Kennedy did to save the area around uh, Lafayette Park before the, uh, the Eisenhower had already approved for the historic buildings to be raised on the east and west sides of the park and for large government office buildings to be placed there. Mrs. Kennedy and President Kennedy facilitated pushing those buildings back and maintaining the historic integrity of the, the feel around the park. So, uh, so that's a, th those markers will go up on Mrs. Kennedy's birthday, which is July 28th, and it will help teach and tell the story because during normal times, when thousands of people transverse that park, they have no idea the history or what happened beneath their feet. This will now give them that cause. And I'm going to say in normal times, because the park's been closed for a day, excuse me, for a year up until today, and the park just reopened. So I was really excited this afternoon to look out there and see real people in the park. When might we expect the publication of the next book in the series? Uh, we, all, we probably in a year, probably a year, year and a half from now. And will that conclude this series or do you see it continuing? I think it will. It'll be a three-part series. You know, I had our, we had a meeting of our publications committee of our board yesterday, and there's so many great ideas and so many things that we could publish. And we are very fortunate that in a time when people tend to be going more toward digital information, we do well with that. But our publications, our books, our quarterly magazine, they do really, really well. I think people, uh, probably most of the people on this call, uh, including me, you know, still like to have those uh, physical books and still like to read paper. And I, I do want to mention again, thank you for letting me give this plug. Both of the books we've mentioned, James Hoban, The Architect, and the book on the Scottish Stonemason, The Ideal American Architecture, are available not only from the White House Historical Association, but from the Museum of History gift shop. 
and you've signed some book plates. So if you purchased a book from us, we can slip one of those book plates in with you. And I'll be happy to send out that email for anyone. They make great gifts. In fact, I understand President Biden has given this book as a gift to a few people. <laughs> yeah, as I said, I had the privilege of presenting the Hoban book to the president of the day before St. Patrick's Day when it was released. And he made a plug uh, using it. Uh, he uh, did a, his um, uh, St. Patrick's Day online message and he held up the book. And I'm told, although I haven't been over there recently, I'm told it's still on the coffee table in the Oval Office. So that, that's pretty good. I heard he may have given it as a gift to, was it the prime minister of Ireland or the president there, someone on a diplomatic visit? Yes, and he also asked copies for all of his grandchildren, which I thought was wonderful. He wanted to give that to them as a gift. Well, what a great compliment. Uh, so we have been talking about, you've been talking about the White House and the man behind the design, James Hoban. And as you said, unlike some of his contemporaries, William Thornton, uh, Benjamin Latrobe, he is not uh, as well known. Why do you think his name, he was relatively obscure, even in most architectural studies, until your work and some of the recent publications. Well, uh, Benjamin Latrobe, who you mentioned, was a very renowned uh, British architect, probably the first true architect to do work here uh, in this country. He designed uh, St. John's Church on Lafayette Park, that's the yellow Episcopal Church that, you're, uh, that our uh, friends watching tonight will be familiar with but also historic Decatur House, which is where I am tonight, which is our base of operations here on Lafayette Park. And uh, he was very well known, a very sophisticated. Uh, Hoban, uh, not, uh, certainly not as well known, probably not as sophisticated, a little, little rougher around the edges. Uh, but uh, Hoban, uh, uh, one tragic thing about Hoban is we lost all of his records, all of his papers uh, to a, a fire in his house here in Washington. So very little is left. I think just a very, uh, two or three documents in his own hand. We have the medals that he won. And that's another interesting story about Hoban. Earlier in his career, he chose to receive a medal, a coin type medal in recognition of his work in lieu of some pay because he knew the money would be spent, but he could take that medal and show it around and it would serve as a resume to prove that he had done uh, this really good uh, work. And uh, I think, I don't know if he showed off that medal to George Washington or not, but I thought that was pretty shrewd of him uh, to do that. He came from relatively humble beginnings. He did. Uh, what we, more so than we might expect. And he was an Irishman. And as you pointed out, he was a Roman Catholic, which may have contributed his decision to come to America. That's right. There were the penal laws in Ireland that uh, began in uh, the late 1600s. They were actually beginning to fade uh, by the time of Hoban, but these really restricted the advancement of any Roman Catholics in any professional sector or the government. So really to advance and develop a name uh, in his field as a Roman Catholic, he would have to leave and come to this country. Now, as I said, it's a little bit pursuit of the American dream, probably wouldn't have called it that at the time, but he's a true example uh, in our early, in the early years of our capital city here in Washington, uh, that he really was in pursuit of the American dream and, and uh, certainly achieved it. I mean, what the very few people whose uh, entire life and career can be summed up in three words uh, and have it, those three words recognizable around the world. Now, he was a carpenter who then studied design and construction in Dublin right. and, and studied under Thomas Ivory, one of That's the leading right. Irish designers, we, we use the word architect, though you said it was not in vogue, was not the term used at the time. Right. Um, came to America, he was around 30, I believe. He was in his mid to late 30s uh, when okay. he came. Uh, we only have one image of him, and it's the image that's on the, the cover of the book. And this is actually a small, it's much larger here than it is in real life. It's a small wax a portrait that is in the White House collection. His son is reported to look very much like him, and you'll often see a picture of his son in, um, in records representing it to be him, but it was not. Uh, there was that only the one surviving image of him uh, that's in the White House collection. And so uh, Hoban went, arrived in Philadelphia, made his way to Charleston, where he had a, that fateful meeting with Washington, right. um, was invited, as you discussed this, there was a competition to design the White House. Hoban was encouraged to, to apply, 
And as you and I think some others suspect, he was sort of Washington, may have been Washington's choice, perhaps all along, or certainly a favored choice. And it may well, I do think, as I said, Washington had his thumb on the scale. I mean, he he knew what he wanted, and Washington tended to get what he wanted. And uh, he liked the he knew that Hoban had the experience to build a stone house, which is what he wanted. He knew that Hoban would be able to to marshal and assemble the workers, but still mm -hmm. take a uh, still be deferential to Washington and what Washington uh, wanted. And so there was clearly a reason. I don't think the synergy between Thomas Jefferson as a builder and George Washington as the president would have worked out too well. Um, we have some people who, who want to know a little bit about the actual White House structure itself. How many rooms are in the White House? Well, that has varied too. That has changed uh, uh, off and on. Um, I honestly, at this moment, can't tell you the number of rooms in the White House, but um, that's, that has changed over time. I was asked recently if um, George Washington and James Hoban, and this goes to that answer, if James Hoban and George Washington would recognize the White House if they were to walk into it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I know they would, because having walked in Leinster House in Dublin and had that same feel, it's the feel that you get when you walk into that entrance hall of the White House. And they would certainly recognize the configuration and the spatialness of it's there. But things have moved and changed over time. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt moved the, the staircase from the end that, and made the state dining room larger and moved it uh, to the entrance hall. And so things, uh, rooms that were in the basement that had been used for domestic purposes or for some of the the enslaved persons to work are now actually functional rooms like the diplomatic reception room and the Vermeer room and the China room. So those have changed over time as have the, the number of rooms from time to time. And I think something else that's changed is the square footage as that that's varied with some of these renovations as well. It has. Coolidge actually <laughs> added an upper level uh, which became uh, problematic uh, given the weight uh, Coolidge thought he was doing a really great thing by adding uh, another uh, addition up to the top, adding more square footage and living space. But what that did was it pressed down on those timbers from the early 19th century, uh, only exacerbating the problem that Truman encountered uh, in the late um, 1940s. And you mentioned there are actually six floors to the White House. Now, not six that are visible. That's right. Um, and there's some of them are like mezzanines uh, that you that are deceptive. Uh, they will put a, they put a little mezzanine in between floors. And so, uh, for example, in the kitchen, you will go up some little stairs and the pastry shop is in a little mezzanine level. The chief usher's office, who's like the general manager of the White House, uh, their office is on a little mezzanine level that's tucked between uh, the entrance hall and the old family dining room. Uh, right here on the north side of the White House. And so it's really um, a fascinating uh, structure. But when we look at it today, as you look, we're just stand out here on Pennsylvania Avenue and look at the White House, you would really in your mind's eye see two main, the, the state floor and then the, the living floor, the residence floor. Of course, there's a, a, a ground floor, basement floor below that, and then a sub-basement to that and probably even some security things that, that I don't even know about beneath that. Uh, but it's a, it's a little, it's, it's a strange arrangement that's been added to and worked on over the years, but it works. And it's incredible to think, think about this. That one white building is the home to the president and his family. It's the office to the president and his staff, including the East and West wings. It's the ceremonial stage upon which our nation receives our most important visitors from around the world. And on top of that, during normal times, five or 600,000 people will walk through that. Can you imagine having five or 600,000 people walk through your living room every year? So a lot of activity takes place in that building. And that's another thing that we do is we have to replace things like the long red rug in the cross hall because of that foot traffic that has to be replaced with some regularity so that it it's, doesn't look threadbare and it stays always looking at that museum standard. We've had a, actually, that brings up some questions we've had of uh, several people ask this. Are there any renovation pro, uh, plans or projects at the White House going on currently or planned for the upcoming year? Well, we still have some uh, 
we have to finish a project. It's not unusual for projects to begin in one administration and be completed in another. I'll go back to that wonderful suite of French Belanger furniture I talked about. We have the uh, 10 pieces we've acquired and we have some reproduction pieces. Starting with Mrs. Obama and ending with Mrs. Trump, we did an $800,000 restoration of that suite of furniture, bringing over Parisian artisans, going back to the original uh, types of fabric and design. It sounds like an extraordinary amount of money and it was, but it is exquisite today. That lapped two uh, administrations. We still have some red room upholstery that is to be finished. It began under uh, Mrs. Trump and is being finished under Dr. Biden. Uh, and we will soon be sitting down with, uh, although we're already working with Dr. Biden and her staff on a variety of things. She actually spoke at our First Lady Symposium this, fa this past Friday, uh, but we'll be soon finding out what her ideas and vision is uh, for what she'd like to do at the White House. I think it's really important that I tell you one more piece to this story and it, also going back to how incredible Mrs. Kennedy was. Remember, she was 31 years old when her husband was elected president of the United States. She was first lady for less than three years, but the processes and the procedures that she put in place are still what governs and manages historic preservation and acquisition at the White House today. There's the creation of the curator, which was conceptualized by her and done by Mrs. Johnson, the creation of the White House Historical Association, but the third leg of that stool is something called the Committee for the Preservation of the White House. They have no staff, they have no budget, they simply serve as an advisory committee for the president and first lady. They're the heads of great museums and galleries, historic homes, and when a first lady thinks that she wants to do something, she'll go to that committee, they'll consider it, make a recommendation, and then come to us to do the research and the funding. So Mrs. Uh, Dr. Biden will soon be uh, creating that committee for the preservation of the White House consulting them about ideas that they would like to take on and then coming to us to, uh, to, work, that, to work that plan. Do we know when the White House became, it took on that moniker, the White House? Is there yes. a story yes. about that? Yeah, the first time that was used uh, was in the Teddy Roosevelt administration when he had it put on the executive stationery, the White House. Of course, that's perfectly familiar to us today. But uh, prior to that, some reference had been made to white. Now, the stone is actually a, um, uh, a sand color here. Uh, I happen to have a piece of it right here. It's sort of a, a sandstone and very similar to what would have been used in Edinburgh. It was whitewashed uh, by the stonemasons and the, 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 the builders of the White House to keep water from getting into the cracks and then freezing and cracking. And so it took on a white aura. Uh, it wasn't until later after the fire, uh, much later when it became painted a white. Uh, and of course it continues to be painted white today. It's a funny story during the Carter presidency, the National Park Service, which is responsible for the exterior of the building and the grounds, went into President Carter and they said, um, President Carter, we have a, a real problem. We're trying to paint a layer of paint on the outside of the house, but the paint is not sticking. Well, it turned out they had, I believe it was over uh, 20, pair, 20 layers of, of paint that was just layer after layer after layer after layer, so it was no longer adhering. So a project was undertaken that wasn't completed until the Bush 41 presidency, where they went around the entire house section by section and completely stripped it back to the bare stone and then repaint, sealed it and repainted it. Uh, but it had taken on so many layers of white paint over the years uh, that it really became a problem. So, uh, you know, they, they, they uh, the, it's, I thought it was wonderful to hear that President Carter himself uh, got involved in solving that problem with the Park Service. Um, we, are, we have some people who, are, who wonder, since Lafayette Square is now open, they're excited about perhaps visiting the White House. Um, what's happening with the White House tour program? I know that's the Park Service, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it's actually, it's actually not the Park Service. Oh, okay. uh, they operate the White House Visitor Center, which we fund and they operate. Um, and they will sort of, uh, their rangers will be outside marshalling 
uh, the visitors as they come into the White House, but there's actually an office in the White House called the White House Visitor's Office. Before 9-11, you essentially just showed up in Washington, got a ticket. We gave out tickets to go through the White House. You would queue up uh, down along the ellipse and line up and go through the White House. After 9-11, the uh, tours completely stopped for a few years. And when they resumed, uh, Laura Bush instituted a program, which I think, I actually think is terrific. The tours are now guided, uh, or now, tour tickets are now disseminated through members of Congress and senators. And if you're uh, an international visitor, uh, through your embassy, embassy. So it's a much more equitable dissemination of tickets. And uh, they go pretty quickly. You have to write your congressman uh, well ahead of time uh, to say that you're going to be in town. And I am as eager as anyone for those tours to resume. We are strong advocates for the accessibility of the White House. If you go on our website, you can see a, a digital tour of the White House, a 360 degree tour. We have a great app that you can download and take a tour of the White House, but there's nothing like going through it uh, yourself. So I. I hope everyone uh, it will have an opportunity to come to Washington and, and make a plan. If you can't get to the White House during your tour, we do have the White House Visitor Center, which is a, sorry, I can't speak tonight, a Smithsonian caliber museum. It's on Pennsylvania Avenue, just across the street from the Willard Hotel that is really worth seeing whether or not you get to go to the White House or not. We are probably familiar with some of the the official rooms of the White House. We've seen them on press previews. We've seen them on tours. How much of the rooms really reflect the personality of the family living there? I guess, how much control does the first family have about the decor? Well, that's a really good question. There's no law that says the blue room has to be blue. So much of what is you see at the White House is custom and tradition. And of course, it's important for our leaders to adhere to custom and tradition. And Everyone that uh, we've had the privilege of working with uh, has done so, but they can. Uh, I think it's a wonderful thing that we have this committee for the preservation of the White House. You have the White House Historical Association. So there are really some checks or guardrails, if you will, uh, against just some radical departure from uh, custom and tradition in how these important rooms look uh, there at the White House. But things do change. You know, the George Washington portrait by Gilbert Stewart that's in the East Room, everybody you would talk to would think it must have always hung in the East Room. Well, no, it didn't always hang in the East Room. It hung in other places. And to some uh, people in past White House history would think it would be very strange that the Gilbert Stewart painting would be hanging in the East Room. But to us, that's a very traditional place for it to hang. So things do get moved and shifted around from time to time. Uh, but the it's it's amazing really how serious the presidents and first ladies take their responsibility of, and the integrity of their possession uh, of this home. Now we had a, a question about the Jackson presidency. I understand he opened up the, so many of the rooms to the public and some people wondering, have we, ha, what, you know, letting all the public in, letting visitors into your home, there's wear and tear. Some people might say damage um, and asking a little bit about just perhaps some of the challenges in trying to maintain the structure and make it accessible. Well, in Jackson's day, and for many of our early presidents, New Year's Day was an opportunity that the doors of the White House were flung open and come one and come all uh, to see the president. The, the thing most similar to that, uh, that I can think of happening in modern history, and you may remember this, it was the day after the inauguration of Bill Clinton. And he and Al Gore stood in the diplomatic reception room for hours and hours and hours as they greeted people that were invited, the public was invited to come through and they wound their way through the White House, the diplomatic reception room and shook hand with thousands and thousands of people uh, that day. There are parties and events now, uh, but not an opening, fling open the doors and, and invite them in like there used to be. Probably the most iconic part of the White House aside from the facade is the Oval Office. Uh, when did that become part of the structure? Was that part of Hogan's concept? Uh, or was that something that came in later? It came in later. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt mm -hmm. uh, built the West Wing uh, and then there was a president's office there, but it wasn't until uh, subsequent presidents that uh, there've been a few iterations of the Oval Office. Uh, when it first became an Oval Office, it was in the center, the South center of the West Wing. 
Uh, now it is on the southeast corner of the West Wing um, and has been there since uh, FDR, I believe. Uh, and I don't see any prospect for that ever changing. Uh, we have another question from the audience wondering, what's the oldest item in the collection? Well, I've already spoken of it and it's the Gilbert Stewart of George Washington is the only item in the White House that was in the White House in November of 1800 when John and Abigail Adams moved in the White House. If you've seen David McCullough's uh, series on uh, John Adams, uh, it's propped up there uh, uh, in the East Room uh, when they come into the house uh, for the first time. Of course, the White House was not finished by any means when they moved in, but that is the oldest item uh, that has been in the White House. It was only removed, of course, the famous story of Dolly Madison having it cut loose and taking to save it from the British fire. But then of course it was returned. Um, that brings her, she's another North Carolinian. We want to give that plug, even though she didn't live here that long, but she was born in North <laughs> Carolina. So we'll take, we'll take credit for that. Um, we had a, a question going back to the workers, uh, uh, the people who built, actually built the White House. Um, we, thanks to the, the research, thanks to the evidence we have, we know that there were professional artists, the Scottish stonemasons who came in, there were enslaved people. Um, right. Hobbit himself was a slaveholder. Uh, and we know at least some of the names of the people. Do you have any sense of maybe what percentage or how many enslaved people may have worked on the White House? You know, I don't know a, a percentage. Uh, one of the challenges that we have faced in identifying who the enslaved people were is they were not paid uh, by their names. Their name of their owner would be on the, the payroll listing. And so we've had to take the research, those extra steps uh, to find out what slaves these people would have owned and look at their records and see what they have about being loaned to the White House project. Um, but over the course of those years from 1792 to 1800, even the few years beyond that the White House was being built and worked on, I don't know that we know a number or can even guess a number of total people that came and went uh, from the project. Um, and you mentioned free workers. Are we talking about free people of color or as well as enslaved workers uh, both. Um, who were involved? Both. And we, we had a, another question that you and I talked briefly about the, the cornerstone, but we actually had a, an audience member wondering uh, a little different question. Was Washington present? Was there a special ceremony or who was there when, we, when the cornerstone was laid? Uh, the Masons were there. George Washington was not there. Uh, he was present at the cornerstone laying of the Capitol building, but not uh, of the White House. There's a great mystery that surrounds this, this cornerstone. Uh, there have been many attempts to find it. Uh, Truman referenced having found it during the Truman renovation. He himself referenced that, but we found no other records, no other indication, certainly no photograph, which you would have to imagine if it had been found, photograph would have been taken of it. Uh, but it's one of the true mysteries uh, of the White House uh, today. And so we, another question for the audience wondering, um, are you, have you been a consultant on any films that have featured the White House or been about perhaps that structure? A <laughs> little bit of a sore subject with me. It really bothers me that so many films about the White House are, they have it blowing up or exploding or doomsday scenario. And, and that really bothers me. I used to really bother me watching the West Wing when you see this looks, makes the West Wing look huge and cavernous with all these, this rabbit warren of halls and corridors. And actually the West Wing itself is very small. And you, if that number of people worked in the West Wing, they would be falling out the windows. But um, we do have some members of our board that have served as consultants on shows like Veep uh, and other uh, uh, shows. Uh, they tend to hire former White House staff to tell us uh, what it was, what, what meetings like this are like, or what it's like in the situation room, or what is it like when the president goes upstairs at night. Um, I will tell you that we have a treasure trove of images, historic images of the White House. And we are, we are frequently uh, reached out to by television studios and production companies for movies for images of the White House. So when Steven Spielberg, Spielberg Steven Spielberg, did his movie on Abraham Lincoln, he wanted as many images as we could get and give him from the Lincoln era of the interiors of the White House. So, and we will frequently license 
Uh, we have the rights to quite a bit of the White House art, certainly all the presidential and first lady portraits. And so we will frequently license the use of those for television studios. And, uh, but we make those images free to use for students, scholars, authors, journalists that want to use them for any kind of uh, news or education purposes. That's a lower res. You. We do the low res available for free, the high res for the studios. Just did another important service that the, the Historical Association provides to the public and to scholars. Um, with that, I think we're going to wrap up the Q&A. There's still a few questions, but I, I know that we've covered, I think, a lot of the basics, a lot of the main things that are people are interested in. Um, I do want to thank you so much for your work, for making this available, taking your time to be with us tonight. And I'm going to turn the floor back over to our director, uh, Mr. Ken Howard. Well, as for, before Ken takes over okay. uh, to close, I just want to say again, apologize for our technical difficulties. You know, we've been doing this for a year. You'd think we would have our, our act down. So I apologize for that. And if anybody had a question that they were uh, unable to get asked, uh, please email me here at the association. And if it's something that I can't answer, I'll have one of our historians uh, respond to it and get back in touch with you. Stuart, thank you very much for a great program. We so appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, and thank you, Audius, for joining us this evening as well. I think, uh, Stuart, you did a great job, and we certainly learned a lot about the history of the White House. Well, uh, to learn more about more virtual programs offered by the North Carolina Museum of History, please visit the museum's webpage at ncmuseumofhistory.org. In fact, this next week, we have three programs that may be of interest to you. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock, our next History and Highballs program, Meshugana, will explore how Jewish cuisine relates with food in the South. And next Wednesday, we have two more programs. Our History at High News series will offer a closer look at the Colonial Inn in, William, in Hillsborough. While that evening at 7 o'clock, we'll continue our World War II lecture series with a program on the thousands of German POWs who were detained in the state. For more information on these and other programs, please visit our website or visit ncmoh-events.com. Again, thank you all for joining us tonight and you hope you all have a very pleasant evening. And Stuart, thank you again. Thank you so much. Take care, have a good night.